us tonight for this AARP Lounge and Learn that asks the question, are you really ready to retire? We have four panelists with us tonight from across North Dakota who will share their retirement experiences and insights to help others make their retirement decisions best for them. Right now, we have an anonymous poll that we would like to uh, hear from you on, and we're interested in knowing what you're thinking about retirement. Where are you right now in relation to retirement? Is it going to happen soon? Or maybe you're already retired? And for those of you watching on YouTube, we stream live to YouTube as well. Um, you won't see the poll. It's, it's only for those watching live on Zoom. And then we will take a look at those results with our panelists in just a little bit. So give us your thoughts on retirement. We're interested in knowing where you all are. And, and um, also, we want to remind you of all the really good retirement tools that AARP has on its website. There's There are things such as a Medicare enrollment guide and lots of Social Security and Medicare resources that would be just very helpful as you make your decisions and make your plans on retirement. So um, we'll have some of those links in the chat along the way, as well as other great tools and information um, that we can share with you in post-event emails as well. So um, anyway, thanks again to our Greeters tonight, Val and Bob Entringer from Bismarck. If, if any of you are ever interested in being a virtual volunteer with us, we'd love to have you join us. We have lots of fun and we provide all the training that you need to do a great job. And, and um, please let us know by just emailing us um, or contacting us in, in one way or another. I want you to uh, note the Zoom features, including Q&A, and don't be afraid to ask any questions tonight. We've got some questions lined up for our uh, panelists, but we know that you're going to have some of the best questions. So please feel free to put those in the Q&A, and um, we'll address as many as we can along the way. And remember, these programs are being recorded, and will be on YouTube uh, later on on our YouTube channel, be available there. So that is also the case. So now I'd like to introduce you to our panelists today. So we'll have them all turn on their cameras and their microphones. And I'm just so excited to introduce you to my new, well, one is an old friend and, and the others are new friends of mine. And, and um, I'm going to start with Margie Handy. Margie ranched with her husband near Amadon prior to retirement and now lives in the Bowman area. And Margie is going to talk to us uh, from, with a Western perspective and a rural perspective. And I'm really eager to hear about that. Also with us is Keith Witt. Keith is the former chief of Biz the Bismarck Police Department and after retiring, relocated to Garrison with his family and is very involved in the community there. So we're looking forward to hearing from Keith. And a friend of mine is joining us, Deb Mather. Deb is an Edgley native who retired from a long career as a credit union CEO and now lives in Fargo and, and retired a few years ago. So we're gonna hear more about Deb's retirement as well. Also with us is Brent Askvig, and you might notice that last name. Uh, Brent is actually the father of our state director, Josh Askvig. So Brent retired from the Center for per the Persons of with Disabilities at Minot State University about a year and a half after his wife retired from her job in the medical field. So they're both kind of dealing with retirement uh, together here at the same time. So we welcome you all and look forward to hearing your stories. But now let's take a quick look at that poll <clears throat> to see what the results are, to see where our audience is in relation to retirement. Okay, so we've got 41% of the people have said they're retiring in the next year. Very interesting. And then thinking about it in the next three to five years is 26%. And then waiting more than five years, 15%, and already retired 15%. And some are never going to retire completely. And I totally get that. I think that's the case for, for people these days. We're always going to stay busy with something in one way or another. So, hey, panelists, that was really interesting. Now, um, with that, we're going to have each of you tell us a little bit more about your retirement story and we're gonna have a little bit of that from each of them and then we'll come back with a bunch of questions. So we're gonna start with Margie and Keith is on deck followed by Deb and Brent. So Margie, take it away. Tell us about your retirement story. Well, hi everyone. Um, I am talk I'm talking with you tonight from Bowman. We, um, we are living in Bowman now, my husband and I. 
We uh, ranched for 35 years be on, uh, between Amadon and Medora in the Badlands. It was um, a family ranch that we bought. And of course, um, loved the land, loved the cattle, loved the, loved the community. So like uh, when, you, when you retire and have to leave where you lived and move to town, it, it's quite an adjustment. Um, our, we're probably a little unique because we worked together all the time. So we, we retired together the, the same way. Um, so it had to be a mutual thing. I guess the, um, the cause or what, what brought us to that, I was 63, Carrie 65, um, was with health issues with, with him. Um, it got to where too much physical work, we had to hire such stuff done, we could see it was time, it was time for us to, um, to move to town. So um, we kind of did it in steps. And I think that made it easier. First of all, we, we came to that decision that the time had come, we needed to, we needed to start on our retirement. And then the next step was we had to find the right person, we weren't ready to sell our ranch, maybe never will be ready to sell our ranch, but we had to find the right, the right um, young couple. We wanted a, a young couple, a young family to, um, to lease it. And so we did, we found a, a great young couple that wanted to ranch. Well, then, then the next step, we, uh, we didn't just find them and move to town. We, they came and they lived in a trailer house that we had started out living in and and um, we stayed there for almost two years, um, just, just teaching them what we could teach them and letting them get comfortable and lear learn until everybody felt like the time was right. And, and then um, they moved into our log house and we loaded up, the, loaded up what we could and we moved to Bowman. Um, the day we drove out of our yard was the hardest day of our life not going to tell you anything different about that but it hasn't been it, it's turned into a pretty good thing um needed needed quite a bit of adjustment um my husband didn't have much for hobbies his hobby was riding horseback uh roping uh those kind of things and so um that that's something we should have done differently should have we we didn't golf we didn't a lot of things that people have for hobbies other than yard and garden and most of our hobbies kind of had something to do with work so um that part of the adjustment has been that that's been an issue but we're getting better um I love to quilt and that's been great I I can still do that no matter where I am um I had friends in town and been able to um, join clubs. I go to the library book club, um, can go to the rec. My husband and his, has been able to go to the cardiac rehab three times a week and um, take care of himself. And so um, I think because we did it gradually and it was our idea to retire, we weren't forced to retire. We, we had the, the right mindset. Um, we love being in town in the winter. It's nice not to have to worry about the pipes freezing and the road blowing shut and whether we bought in or made enough hay. Uh, it, it's okay not to have all that responsibility. But honestly, it's hard to be in town in the summer when you've lived where we lived all those years in the Badlands. So we bought a fifth wheel camper. We have kind of learned how to fish. We're we're not great at it, but we're getting better. And um, we've done quite a bit of camping. Um, so there, there's ways to kind of uh, appreciate the best part and, and um, you know, make the other part work. So that's, that's kind of my story about how, how we handled, uh, I think agriculture, ranchers, farmers, their retirement story is probably a little bit different than um, if you if you don't have to leave the location. Uh, we hope to do more traveling. We haven't been able to the last couple of years, just like everybody else. But that's still a goal and a plan and something to look forward to.
Oh, okay. thank you. Thank you, Margie. That was, that was great to hear about all that. And yeah, there's a lot to consider when you're a farmer, a rancher, um, and retiring. So thank you for that. So now we're going to move over to Keith and Keith, let's hear more about your retirement story. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Um, as Doreen mentioned, I retired from the Bismarck Police Department back in uh, basically June of 2012. I had worked at the police department for 31 years, my last about four and a half years as chief. Um, when I retired, it was a little different than I had planned. I had planned on probably being there a couple more years at least, uh, but uh, circumstances being what they were, primarily the stress of the job, uh, a lot of uh, big things, unfortunate things uh, that made the job difficult happened in 2011. So I had accomplished most of the goals I wanted to do. So I felt that that was just the appropriate time to leave. Um, my wife had already moved from Bismarck, uh, was living in Garrison and commuting to her job as an insurance agent in Minot. So so that allowed me to uh, basically get get home with her and have more time together. So um, I was born in Bismarck uh, when I was a third grader. My family moved to Hankinson. So I finished growing up there, graduated from high school in Hankinson, uh, got my associate's degree from the State College of Science in Wahpeton, and then finished up, uh, got my bachelor's degree out of UND and was hired basically right out of college Bismarck. In fact, I had to take my finals early and get out of school about a month early in order to, to meet my hiring date that the, there wasn't any flexibility in that. So, so it all worked out well. Um, basically, my wife and I had uh, gotten married uh, basically when we moved to Grand Forks to start college. So had a good career in law enforcement, but basically I retired from law enforcement in 2012. I haven't retired, uh, I guess, officially or formally yet. Uh, when I moved to Garrison, um, basically had a vacation for about a month and then went back to work. Uh, the good thing was that I was able to kind of be picky and choosy about what I was going to do in the future. So that was one of the big things I was looking forward to. So so that did work out. I have done uh, several different things uh, since moving to Garrison uh, for employment. Uh, I actually have my own business for a couple of years as well. So, But the big thing was uh, in a small community, uh, especially, and I'm sure it's uh, nowadays in a large community, everybody's looking for volunteers. The volunteer pool seems to be shrinking. Everybody struggles with that. So uh, Fortunately and unfortunately, maybe to some degree, there was a lot of volunteer opportunities in Garrison. Uh, sometimes I had a hard time saying no. So at times you get overcommitted. So that was one thing that I've learned that I would like to pass on is um, a lot of organizations need help, but uh, I would recommend kind of be choosy or picky about what you decide to get involved in. Uh, it's easy to get involved, but it's hard to get uninvolved in some organizations, <laughs> especially without feeling guilty about not helping out or doing your fair share. But, but that's definitely um, a way to keep occupied. There's, you know, that's a big thing I found out since um, retiring from law enforcement. There's a lot of other things out there in the world to keep you busy, keep you occupied. And I found that's definitely what I needed because uh, it was definitely a busy job. Um, pretty much all the time, a lot of call time, uh, a lot of extra hours. And then all of a sudden there's really nothing requiring my attention. So, so, you know, you have to plan for that and try to find a way to have your time occupied. Fortunately, I do have some hobbies. Uh, so I probably had an advantage from what Margie said, her and her <laughs> husband face, but so far, uh, been spending time with those hobbies, not as much as I want to, but I'm working in that direction. So have a lot more flexibility and time for hobbies and family life. Um, but the thing is, my wife's not retired yet. She hopefully will be in a couple of years. So, so I guess our goal is to mutually retire together. So till that time comes, I kind of have to keep myself busy with some work. So, so I guess that's kind of uh, my right. summary in a 
a few minutes. So look yeah, forward to the rest of the you. seminar. You bet. Well, we'll be talking more with all of you here. So thanks, Keith, for sharing your story. That's really interesting and a unique story in itself. So now we're going to move over to Deb Mather. Deb and Deb is coming at us from Fargo. So Deb, will you give us a little bit about your story here, please? I sure will. And it's raining here, everybody. So <laughs> we're waiting snow. Uh, as Doreen had said, I'm an Edgley native. So I'm a North Dakota lifelong resident. Went from Edgeley to Wapaton to Jamestown to Williston and Bismarck and now Fargo for the last 20 plus years. Um, I spent 36 of my work years in credit unions and that's how Doreen and I became friends. I have uh, two grown sons and four grandchildren and uh, I've been retired nearly four years now. Um, mine should be called what I've learned and in the words of Dick Van Dyke, to me, retirement means doing what you have fun doing. Um, for many people, work or career is something to do until we reach that ultimate goal, retirement. Um, for others like me, a career is a major part of life. Uh, when planning to retire, I asked Doreen and some other close friends, if I'm no longer chairman of this board and Deb Mathern, president of Fargo Public Schools Credit Union, who will I be? Um, my identity was so tied with my career. And one who was retired said, you'll be whoever you want to be. And that was great advice, very wise words. So um, retirement is our chance to redesign our life into something that, something new and something different and whatever it is that we wanna do. When retiring, some people um, choose to wing it. They, they don't really have a, a plan and they're, they decide each day when they get up what they're gonna do and they're happy with that. But for people like me, whose work was such a big part of my identity, something more structured was necessary. Um, a blueprint and a plan was helpful to me. So those nine, 10 hours that you spend prepping commuting, working, all the planning that goes into your workday is now your, those are your hours. What are you gonna do with those? Um, do you have a need for productivity? I was very production oriented. I have to, I have to accomplish things because my mom taught me that <laughs> or I, uh, my day was wasted. And she, she really, that was her mantra, I think. So, um, I needed that plan. I'm a list maker. So are you a list maker? If so, jot down some ideas of things that you like to do, things that appeal to you and make you happy. Because that's the goal of retirement, right? Being happy. Um, just a few more things, uh, words of advice. Don't be afraid to say, you know what? This doesn't work for me. Um, I'd like to work part-time and our workforce definitely needs people like us that we need a workforce and we show up and, and employers love that. Right now you can earn nearly 19,000 if you have not fully reached your retirement age um, or 50,500 if you have reached your full retirement age. So you can still work part-time, make a little travel money or some fun money. If you're single like me, your workport, workplace is probably your social, um, your social outlet. So I encourage you to think ahead to how you will fill that void if you don't have those social outlets. Do you have hobbies, fishing, gardening? I mean, can't do some of that stuff in the winter. Do you like reading and crafts like Margie? Um, grandkids and family to fill your time. Volunteering and thank you AARP for making that a possibility for us to, to give back to our communities and to help fulfill our lives. Um, do you like to travel? And we all need something to look forward to. There again, my friend Doreen is someone who taught me that years ago. Well, we were having a girls weekend and she made that statement and it's always stuck with me. Um, COVID hit just as I was retiring and a friend and I had been making plans to volunteer and I was traveling often and that didn't happen anymore. So that was difficult for a lot of people. Um, that social vo void was more pronounced. My last issue is finance. 
know your monthly expenses. And um, Brent, maybe you're going to talk about this a little more, but go through your checking account and your credit card statements and put it down on a computer program or paper and know what you spend. I have asked a friend that I was trying to help and he had no idea what he spends. And, and I, I found that a little surprising. Um, will you start drawing social security right away? If so, will it cover your monthly expenses? That's important. And can you afford to retire then? Do you have a good retirement account? And is it pre-tax like a 401k or after tax like a um, um, Roth IRA? So that makes a big difference um, retiring with the pre-tax accounts, a lot of places withhold 20% right off the top. So if you're requesting 2000 a month, you're only getting 1600. So um, just that might be your spending money. Um, just a couple more things. Please consult a financial advisor if, if need be. Um, that may not be our, your area of expertise, but those advisors are skilled and they have the tools to help you make decisions and make your plan. Not knowing if you can afford to retire is very stressful. So my advice, have a plan, but be flexible and be ready to make changes. Retire from work, but not from life. Thanks. Very good, Deb. Thank you for all of that. That was great. So um, we uh, got some financial information from our credit union person there. So that was awesome too, right in a nutshell. So thanks, Deb. Now we're going to switch over to Brent Askvig. And Brent, if you would share your story with us on your retirement and how that is going in your household. Well, thanks. And uh, hi, everybody. It's uh, great to be here tonight. Um, um, my name is Brent Askvig. I'm in Minot. Uh, both my wife, Stacy, and I are retired. Um, and probably um, somewhat unusual for folks, maybe others have done this, on our honeymoon, 42 years and uh, two months and 23 days ago, we were um, in Denver and we were talking about our life course and planning and, and Deb talked about, you know, planning things out and the lists and that type of thing. And uh, um, for some reason, Stacy and I decided that we were going to retire at age 57. I have no idea why that 57, we were 20 years old when we got married and why 57, we have no idea. Um, and, and so we talked about that and we talked about that. Uh, in our case, 57 came and went. We watched it go by. Um, we didn't retire at 57. We didn't retire at 58, 59. But my wife did retire at 60. Uh, uh, my wife worked uh, in the medical field for over 30 years uh, for the University of North Dakota. And uh, she had an opportunity. Uh, to retire. We talked about it. We looked at our options. And so we went from two incomes to one income um, at, at age 60. Before we could pull Social Security, before we were really wanting to go into any of our investments, uh, which we were able to stay away from. And so we had have two grown sons. One of them, yes, is Josh, which is how I got here tonight. Um, and, um, and, and Stacy's retired. I'm working and um, she's going around and seeing grandchildren in the middle of the week. And I'm working and I'm working and now she's going on a trip with friends. And I became more, and I encouraged her to retire, but I became more jealous about her opportunities at retirement than I imagined absolutely imagine. So we started talking about retirement for me. When would that happen? How would that work? And we had actually planned for that to be this coming December 31st. But as you know, COVID hit. And um, I was work, working at the university here in Minot. And with COVID coming, I moved my office to home, in fact, right here. And with my wife right behind me being retired, and I'm here in this desk working, we started talking and talking, and we took Deb's advice about talking to our um, financial advisor. What can we do? When can we 
uh, retire, how can we do that? Uh, Deb talks about uh, being a list maker and um, having you know, the things to do. My wife and I, of course, put together the spreadsheet with all of the income we, and all of those kinds of things and how much we thought we needed. Uh, and my wife was going from our expenditures as non-retired people because the finances changed, we found, really in interesting ways. And so we talked to our financial advisor and he said, um, a year before I retired, he said, you could retire today. You could retire right now. Um, and I said, no, I'm not ready. Kind of like Keith, he talked about having these goals. You know, did we accomplish what we wanted to accomplish at work? I worked for 33 and a half years at the university, and I always had goals and things that I wanted to accomplish, and I didn't think I was quite done. So I retired one year after I was eligible, according to my financial advisor, and one year before I had originally planned, and five years after we had planned on our honeymoon. So um, I now have been retired um, um, 10 months and 10 days. And um, I'm ha happy we've done that. Um, we had uh, goals to travel. Well, and as others have said, the COVID has, has put that into, um, uh, for the most part, put that in limbo for a while for us. We wanted to spend more time with the grandchildren, so watching my wife go to the grandchildren's uh, basketball games and dance recitals and those kinds of things, now I could go. And if we went on a Tuesday and came back on a Thursday and ate the food of our children instead of ours, it worked out great. It worked out great. Um, and... and we both have and had planned in part of our process of getting ready for retirement hobbies. We've always had lots of things to do, lots and lots of hobbies. And we didn't know if we had the kind of money we wanted to keep our hobbies going. So about three years before we retired, before my wife retired, we set up a small business. My wife is a phenomenal stained glass, fused glass artist, phenomenal. And I was doing some painting and then we were getting into woodworking and we made a, a small business, set up a small business that essentially pays for our hobby. Plus now at the point for Christmas presents and gas money when we're able to travel, it actually pays, for, and, and it's still a hobby. We're not into production. We are not trying to make X, Y, Z numbers of things. We just have time now to engage in our hobbies. We go and do them and, and, and that funds it. So you think about the, the things that you do, and I'm not saying to set up businesses, but if you need a little bit of extra, what's your hobby? And can you get something out of that financially to help you along? At least in our case, keeping our hobby going. Um, so, um, you know, it, it was a, a long, long 42 years, two months and 23 days process to today to go through that, to think about that, you know, when you're, when you're 20 and then when you're 30 and then when you're 40 and we were excited at 50, it was only seven more years. Um, and, and, and when we go through the questions that Doreen's going to have uh, for us in a little bit, um, there were some things that, um, and someone had mentioned this, I don't remember if it was Deb or Margie or Keith, the idea of the idealized retirement versus what reality is. And um, the idea that I would walk around in a bathrobe and drink brandy at 10 in the morning was kind <laughs> of the idea, not at all what happened nor should have it ever happened, but the idealized version of what retirement's like versus what retirement is really like was a bit different for us. And we are absolutely happy with it. Absolutely. That is great. Thank you, Brent. That is, that is awesome. Well, now we're gonna to get to some questions with all of you. And uh, we, the first one I have is, what kept you awake at night as you were preparing to retire? What was, the, what was your biggest worry? along the way. And whoever wants to jump in and start, please. You can all take yourselves off mute now and, and uh, 
we'll just have a little visit here. Go ahead, Brent. Uh, um, I did my homework, Doreen, so I was <laughs> prepared. <laughs> um, there were two things that kept me awake before retirement. Um, one was, um, is my work organization going to be okay when I leave? Mm -hmm. I, I, th that, I, I think, was maybe a little arrogant in my thinking about it, but I was the old guy at the university in this department. I was running an $8 million grants and contracts operation with 100 staff. And is it going to be okay? I was there when it started. I was one of the people involved in it all of those years. And um, was it going to be okay? And um, we had planned for um, changes within the organization and done organizational planning to get that ready. But I kept worrying, well, what else did I miss? What else did I? So I, that kept me awake uh, for that year. That that really did. Sure. And the second thing was that that time of transitioning from paycheck into your account for your expenses to investments. That was not really what we did in our lives. That really wasn't we did what we did on a day-to-day -day basis of drawing down funds from investments and looking at all and, and the, the advice of using the financial planner was great. And even though we had many, many meetings with them, we went over and over in our head, this is only one page of many, many that we put together to try and plan. And we kept worrying about that continually. And even into the first few months. Um, and of course, the financial planner mm -hmm. put us on the right path. Yeah, I can imagine. How about the rest of you? What, what kept you awake at night? Margie, anything there? I imagine there were couple things you know I you like. as you when I read that question I I had to smile because our banker friend used to tease me about he said what have you been thinking about while you've been looking at the bedroom ceiling <laughs> you know <laughs> as I was laying awake at night and of course the main thing is the financial part um, are we doing it right and and we did the same you know we have a good a good accountant and we you know we talk things over for a long time, uh, how to do it, how to keep it together. Is it going to be enough? Um, how long? How long should we spread out? What all these and all these uh, things we have to sell: cattle, hay, equipment. Can you do it all in one or two, or do you need five years? Or we yeah. didn't want to have an auction sale. Um, so we. Those are the things. Yeah, that we stared at the bedroom ceiling and <laughs> and uh, thought about and. And then the other thing that was, you know, similar um, to the last panelist was, um, you know, are they going to take a good, are they going to take good care of our ranch when we leave? Who but us is going right. to take such good care of it? <laughs> but because we didn't just have to leave um, as they came, we were able to be together. Um, our confidence level really got better and better and better because we found out other people can do a really good job and wanted to do a good job. So by the time we left two years after we had started this retirement, um, we weren't staring at the bedroom ceiling as much. We felt better leaving. Good. And you, yep, you want good stewards of the land. Taken Absolutely. Out. So you important bet. to us. Yeah. You bet. You bet. Keith or Deb, anything to add to this one? Yeah. I think somewhat, you know, Brent touched on it, but the biggest thing that I guess I worried about or kept me awake and I was getting everything done that I needed to do to make sure there was a smooth transition. You know, I was confident that two deputy chiefs, you know, they were smart, capable guys. I knew they could handle it, but you know, there were certain things that I was responsible for getting done, making sure they were wrapped up. So, you know, they could just kind of take over, um, and I had kind of learned that the hard way because when I took over, some things had kind of fallen through the cracks. So those things kept me awake at night when I was coming into the position. So I definitely didn't want them to happen as I was leaving. So, and then just, you know, try to get all that done on top of this, the regular day to day that's always going on. It, it was a challenge, but I mean, it all worked out. Okay. You just, it's one of those things that you just, you know, Deb talked about That's having fine. lists and plans. You definitely need to, you know, when you know when that final date is, you got to have a plan and kind of a timetable on how to get there the right way. So, 
Right, right. Deb, anything to add or move on? Um, they, they pretty much said it, uh, my legacy, you know, I, I wanted to make sure I left a healthy organization. I spent a year creating a procedures manual. I wanted, like the others, a smooth transition and not to say, oh gosh, she left and just walked out the door. And, and I expressed my other concerns, the social and financial. Yeah. You know. yeah, but I'm gonna start with you now, Deb, on this one. What do you wish you would have done differently? Is there anything that you wish you, you know, looking back now? Um, I wish I would have retired at a different time of year because I retired mm. December 31st. I told the board of directors I would stay for four months in Fargo to be available to uh, work part time. <laughs> that is not fun to do in January, February, March, April when I could have been traveling to a warmer climate. <laughs> and I had such a good person that I had worked with for the 24 years that after a month, she didn't need me very much. So there I sat in the cold climate. Um, <laughs> Just sat in a cold climate. <laughs> so I would retire at a different time of year. And, Make the timing uh, right. Yeah. Just Good. plan it properly. Good Give point. Good. But you did the right thing there. So you, you helped him out. But um, how about the rest of you? What would you have done differently? Anybody have something to share there? Like something glaring that changed? This was really. You know, I, I guess I can't really say it. I, would have done differently. One of the things that probably made it a little bit more difficult when I did retire is moving to a different community right away oh, sure. because my social life was primarily wrapped up in work. You know, and then when I was doing things when I wasn't working, it lot, quite often was people that I worked with was part of that. And then all of a sudden it's not, not only you're not going to work, but that, you know, core group of people that you socialize with you know, they're, you know, over an hour's drive away now. So, so, you know, that was just part of the adjustment, but um, so, I mean, the circumstances, you know, I definitely wanted to, to get home with my wife living in the same community. So yeah. that overrode any of that, obviously, but just kind of something to keep in mind. That would be different to retire and then be in a new community and sort of like Margie a little bit too, um, being in a different space and that kind of thing but um we'll jump to the next question and then um margie and brent feel free to add in anything but margie let's take this one to you first of all how has retirement affected your home life and family relationships with with your family and everything well um there it, it's been really good in some ways because when you are a farmer or rancher, you know, you've got seven day a week responsibilities. Our trips were always get something finished up on Friday, get in the car, drive like crazy, you know, go to our daughters, play with our grandkids, go to our sons, and then get home before, you know, so we could feed on Sunday night or, or you know, it was always short. Well, now we have the freedom, you know, our, our daughter lives in Golden and we have three we have a new baby and a grandson and we have twin grand four year olds. And when we go, we can stay a week. We never stayed in, in 40 years of being married. We never stayed anywhere a week. So it, it, that part of it's been just great. Um, we, we have uh, joined things that we are able to, we, before, when you drive, we were 40 miles in out in the country. And so um, you know, you're not going to run into book club or in the winter, or you weren't going to exercise at a at the lodge swimming pool because um, it was too far. And so we've gotten to do we've gotten to do a lot of things like that that we wanted to do. So um, really, there's been a lot of positive things for us. Very good. Anybody else want to add to that, Brent? Anything to add about home life and family relationships? Yeah, yeah. Our, our our life was pretty structured around our work and our family, and almost always it seemed to be work first. And and yes, we did the trips and we we visited, but it was on a Friday afternoon that we left if we were lucky to get out of work early, back by Sunday evening type of a thing. Um, it's much more flexible. We're able to watch children during school break, grandchildren during school breaks. 
were able to, uh, I, I was with some friends and we were, um, uh, I was hunting and um, staying at, at my friend's house. And I called my wife this week on Monday night and said, come on up and stay Tuesday night. And we'll get back in time for this, but let's, and, and she just said, okay. And, and that would have taken us weeks. Our home routines changed dramatically and it took us quite a while to figure those out. Um, uh, and it was, it was tough because we had our routines that centered on us going to work and being workers. And now it was not rushing in the morning and, and kind of spending time, a little more time together. And what are we, you know, the, the question always was, so what's the plan for today? Well, now we don't really need to say that. Our plan is we know about that because we've had plenty of time together to talk about it. Or we just decide, oh, I don't care. What do you want to do? And, and the, the getting into some of those routines was a little bit different for us. I can imagine. I can imagine. Anybody else want to add to that one? Keith or Deb, anything to add to the? No, I don't really have anything to add. So Keith, do you, now that if your wife is still working, are you the cook and the chef at home and all of that? Uh, stuff? No, far from it. <laughs> not unless you like sandwiches or frozen pizza. So oh, I'm not a cook, so yeah, <laughs> she still does most of the cooking. So I do, make, I'd ask about I do that. get the coffee ready in the morning though. Oh, that's important. Yeah, absolutely. So that bringing me to that, then I was my next question is what motivates you to get up in the morning? And so Keith, what is it for you besides getting up and making that coffee? What else gets you going in the morning? Up there? Well, I'm still working part time. So, you know, getting to those responsibilities and then, you know, focusing on a lot more time now to get things done around the house or to get involved with some of the things I do for a hobby. So always something to look forward to, you know, some, I guess, responsibilities that need to get done. So. Great. Keeps me Deb, going. Yeah. Deb, how about you? What, what mo motivates you to get up in the morning? Your list probably, huh? My list. Yeah. <laughs> I, I try to have something to look forward to for the next day as I go to bed at night and kind of go through things in my head of, well, what can I do tomorrow? And, um, uh, just have a plan. So that's about it. That's I great. Do I, I, I want to. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I think I'd have to have that too. I'd have to kind of like, otherwise I'd just be too scrambled. I think, I don't know. Margie or Brent, anything to add to this one about what motivates you to get up in the morning? Well, I just have to, <laughs> I have to kind of smile at um, getting up in the morning. That's always been, a, my husband is an early riser and um, early riser. And, and that was fine at the ranch. We kind of lived by the sun, you know, when it was light, we got up and, or especially him and made the first coffee and he's still doing that. So, um, uh, and then what? Um, so I, uh, that, I guess it's kind of a combination of the last question you asked, but when he gets up early now, I encourage him to go have breakfast somewhere. Go, go to the sales barn on Monday and have breakfast with the guys. And, you know, if you're going to get up at five or five 30, you know, it's, it's a long day. So um, <laughs> we've, we've had to make some adjustments. I, I can stay in bed a little longer, you know, seven, seven is great in the morning, but um, he's still getting up um, by light. So uh, that's <laughs> some oh, things we can't change. <laughs> right, right. Brent, something to add to that one? Yeah, I would. And, and I, I want to tie this to the, the question that came up in the Q&A uh, uh, about the individual who's uh, semi-retired and, and kind of the idea of meeting people and that type of thing. Um, uh, my job was about people and being involved with people all the time, every day. And I was afraid I was going to really, really miss that. What motivates me is who am I going to see and who am I going to talk to? which means that I've gone to a lot of different kinds of activities, mm -hmm. different kinds of events, and then run into people that I never ran into um, in work. And there are so many, uh, you know, uh, again, the, the whole AARP network and the volunteering is just 
uh, phenomenal. And, and when it cannot be virtual and it can be more face-to-face, -face, um, I, I've seen that happen at AARP and other organizations about being involved, volunteering and that type of thing. Um, but, uh, you know, th there's a club in, in Minot about plants and my wife is into gardening. So I've gone to those kinds of clubs and, uh, and uh, just different kinds of things and, and look for, again, we always said, how do we tie it to our interests? Right. And so now I'm tying it more to what are the things that my wife does that connects me to people that I normally wouldn't connect with. And I, I just, that, that's what gets me going. That's great. And we're going to address that question. What, what we have here is a question from uh, one of our attendees. I've been a single parent and I'm recently semi-retired. I just moved to Bismarck to be closer to my grandchildren. And I think we find that with a lot of people, they move to be closer to family when they retire. So, I mean, that's a different, you know, kind of like Keith moved. And um, But um, I don't know anyone and I have found myself being way too alone. Do you have any suggestions on meeting people? The clubs was good. Do the rest of you have some ideas on ways to meet people? I would I recommend think, contact. Oh. Go ahead, Keith. I'll do it next. Okay. 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 Keith, go ahead. Okay. Well, Brent pretty much touched on, I think it depends upon what your interests are, but they're, you know, service clubs or other informal clubs or organizations, you know, I've, uh, the, you know, the Bismarck Tribune just used to list a page with the different groups and when they meet and stuff, or I'm sure it's available on the website, but depends upon what your interests are and just reach out to one of those organizations and find out a meeting and I'm sure they'll welcome you with open arms and, you know, that's the best way that I think, or one of the better ways that I would meet people outside of my work circle was through the different service clubs I was involved in and, you get to meet people and you get to do things to help your community. So, so I think that's, that's a good option, I believe. That's some good advice. Deb, would, would you like to add to that? I would recommend contacting the, like your local convention and visitors bureau and see what they have for organizations. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so on social media too, there's usually calendars of events going on. I've learned to go by myself and I usually end up meeting someone and if you're not afraid to talk to people. But I've been through that where I moved to Bismarck, didn't know anyone, moved to Fargo and I knew one person and then he moved. So um, I, I get that, but eventually all, all that's good advice of the service clubs and all and volunteering, it, that's when people work together and the camaraderie is built. Right, any other ideas from the rest of you? Well, one one thing that we are have had a chance to be more involved with, and and it's a welcoming group is our church. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you have more time, there's there's always lots of things, and that's a good way to get connected with um, people too. Is it, whether you're in Bismarck or whether you're in Bowman, there's uh, there's always people, there's always need in your church. It's a good idea. I, I would just add one thing, uh, looking at that question again and, and talking about ne being near the grandchildren. One of the things that we've done is that, uh, you know, we've been, whether your grandchildren are in, in preschool and in a child care program or at, a, uh, at someone's place for child care or they're in school, we, we go to those events. And while almost all the other folks around are the age of our children, there's always a few other grandparents around. And I think Deb said, if you're not afraid to talk to someone and you can talk to the other grandparents and pretty soon, and we've made some really great relationships with parents and, and uh, family members our age of all of our children's and friends and their grandchildren's parents' friends. And so it's, it's been a, a, a neat way to kind of tie that together. That's nice. And I'm sure if, if, you know, if somebody's got grandchildren that they moved here for, some of those schools are always looking for volunteers to, yes. you know, read with children or, you know, assist in some ways. And maybe there's some kind of volunteerism there that can happen a little bit too, but, but very good. We have another question here. How has your social life changed since you retired? I mean, a lot of us um, you know, sometimes it, our work is our social life. It's changed now since COVID because 
um, you know, of course, um, especially for those of us who are working from home. But um, how have you seen since your retirement days, your social life, and how have you like, purposefully made some changes to, to make sure that you stay social? Raise your hand, whoever wants to start on that one. <laughs> oh, Brent, I thought I saw your hand first. Okay. Um, and then yeah, yeah. Our, our, our social life has been impacted more by COVID than it has by retirement. Uh, and, and so trying to, to get around some of that and, and, and be involved in some of those kinds of things. It's, um, but we've really noticed our, we have friends that are retired our age and friends who are not retired who are our age. Mm -hmm. And um, our opportunities to connect with them are different different times, different days, and just kind of figuring that out. Um, uh, my wife and I were talking about, well, we need to visit someone and said, well, should we give them a call for Friday? Or it's like, well, it's Tuesday, let's go to lunch. Or let's meet them at the mall Tuesday afternoon for coffee at three. And it's like, oh yeah, they're retired. <laughs> and then we'll call someone up and said, hey, I'm going to go to this thing, this event on, on Thursday morning. You want to go? And they're like, oh, those are the friends that are still working. No, I can't. I'm working. So figuring out some of those opportunity times have been different for us. But otherwise, it's been good. Sure. Deb, go ahead with your comments on your social life changing. Yeah, COVID was a huge impact for everyone. I realized that a lot of my friends were younger than me and still working. So that changed considerably, <laughs> yes. And um, it forced me out of my comfort zone and I had to go out and seek those new relationships. And, and that was okay. I've made people with, uh, met people with different interests and it, it's been a good thing. I miss some of the people that are still working because they can't just drop everything and get together with me like I'd like them to, but um, you make it work. That's right. Margie or Keith, anything to add to your social life? Margie, yours has changed, I'm sure, um, well, it, being in town know, it now. Has. It sure has. Um, we, we've always had a lot of, um, a lot of company at the ranch, you know, people, and it always involved either they were there at noon to eat or they were there at night. It was always a meal. By the time you got to our house, you know, it was time to eat one way or the other. So one of the great things about moving to town is we can eat out some of the time and, and it's fun and we do it with friends and we don't always eat in Bowman. We might get to go to Marmoth some night to the steakhouse, or we might go, um, we might go somewhere for pizza. We might go to the marina in the summer. Um, it, it becomes part of your social life, eating. Um, and, and it's okay with me if I'm not always the cook. Um, so that's been fun. It's been really fun. Another thing is when you have the house in town and we have all these um, friends and um, and, their, and friends of our kids, even their kids are going to school in town or uh, want to come to things in town. And, and so they, many of them headquarter out of our house, the, um, you know, they took swimming lessons this summer. So that's two weeks and here's country kids and they need a place to go in between lessons and until their mom is done and can pick them up at five. So we have, We've had kids in and out and um, it's fun. It keeps us young. Um, I'm, we're close enough to the school that our other friend, I walk over and her little girl comes from kindergarten and we play games and um, it keeps us involved in the school. That way we're learning. And uh, so there's, there, I think a variety of ages in our friends is a good thing. That's great. Oh, I like all that. That sounds fun for you and keep you connected and keep you young. So Keith, what about your social life up in Garrison? Well, probably hasn't changed a whole lot from, you know, before. Um, my wife's still working full time. I'm working part time, but a lot of our social life revolves around the different, we're involved in a lot of the same organizations as far as service clubs or different groups in garrison so 
lot of our social life gets wrapped up in going to the different activities or working different events with those groups. So, and, uh, you know, we each have our own interests and hobby and we kind of do those on our own, but we have some, you know, mutual interests as well. So it gives us things to do That's also. Great. So, yeah. That's great. Well, I tell you what, we have gotten through all of our questions here tonight. This has been just so interesting and I'm going to give you each um, a, a chance to make any last comments. We'll, we'll go around the horn as we started with Margie first and then Keith and then Devin and Brent. So Margie, any last comments you'd like to make here? Um, well, I think, I think we have talked about a lot of things and there are a lot of things to think about when, when you're ready to retire. And I guess I just, you know, I, I think you need to put the time in and have a lot of discussion with your mate because you're going to spend a lot of time with them uh, after you <laughs> retire. So be, sh be sure you have all that kind of talked over. That's right. Good, good advice. Keith, coming to you next. What would you say for any last comments? I think, you know, we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, you know, to begin with, Deb gave a good summary of all the different things to prepare for and plan for. So I would just say um, personally, and I think for a lot of people, your priority shift uh, during your regular career work years, it's all about, you know, how much does it pay? What are the benefits? things like that, then I think when you reach that age where you are ready to retire, your priorities shift to how flexible is it? You know, how much time off do I get? You know, things like that, as opposed to what it, you know, what the paid benefits are. And I know personally, that's where I'm at. And I think probably when you get to that point is a good indicator that you're, you're on the right track or that you're ready for retirement. That sounds good. That sounds good. Deb, any last comments from you? I do. Heed the good advice that you get from people. Um, I had a retired school employee stop in my office at the credit union and say, when you retire, Deb, stay active. She said, you know, move around. If you don't use it, you lose it. And I did not heed her advice like I should have. You know, when COVID hit, I quit the gym and it was too easy to turn into a little bit of a slug. And she was so right. If, if we aren't using our muscles and our body, it's just too easy to put on the extra pounds and get out of shape. And we don't end up feeling good about ourselves. So, and then it's extra hard to try to get back into shape. So stay active, um, get out there, go for a walk, run up and down your stairs if you have to. I'm kind of wearing out my carpet now this week, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> trying to do what I should have done. But, um, and now with the, the cold months coming, if you can find a place to go walking, with, take a friend. Um, it's just much easier to talk and walk and, uh, and stay active. That's really good advice too. That's good all around advice for anyone. So Brent, what about uh, you? Some last comments, please. I, I would just say that um, I, I think about all the kind of major life changes that as individuals or as partners that, that we looked for, we looked for that high school graduation. Oh my goodness, what's it going to be like? And things changed dramatically and were we ready or not? Um, getting married all the planning that often goes into those kinds of events and, you know, that idea of the idealized versus what it really is. Um, um, we may have, some of us may have been surprised in, in some of those kinds of things in, in different relationships. Um, and I, I think Deb and others have said, plan for that, plan for that, just as you would for those other major life changes that are going. I think things like this, um, the, the kinds of things that AARP puts on all the time are the things that make us get ready for this, just as we get ready for other major life changes. Um, and then just, um, you know, it, this truly is a time for yourself. Uh, you know, you've looked forward for this for 20, 30 42 years, two months and 23 days. You've looked forward to this and, and it's there and enjoy it. 
Oh, awesome. Well, great advice. And thank you so much to all our panelists this evening. This has just been really great. All of you shared so much of your personal stories and that helps all of us as we look ahead. And I'm not that far away from retirement. That day will come at some point, but um, we all want to um, do the right thing and think it through and make sure we do everything correctly. So thank you all for your advice tonight. And if you'd anybody would like to ask a question after we stop the recording, um, just stay on and you can pose your question to our um, panelists. They're gonna stick around with us for a little bit. And I wanna say thank you again to Val and Bob Entringer for your help as greeters tonight. And thank you to my colleagues, Josh Askvig, Wendy Hogue, and our new employee, Marnie Peel, for their assistance and support in the background. Thank you very much for that. And please join us next Wednesday afternoon at three o'clock when we're going to be visiting with Clarence Saylor on streaming and smart TVs. I think all of us have been exposed to a lot of streaming and TVs that are um, smart and have all kinds of features and maybe we're not using them to the fullest. So join us and we're going to learn more about that as part of our Passport to Healthy Living series. And remember that these programs are being recorded so that they can be viewed later and you'll find them all on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash AARPND. And all of our event, events, upcoming and past events, can be found at aarp.org slash nd events. And um, you can watch past recordings if you've missed something along the way. For those attending this live event, watch for an email with a survey link where you can provide us with your feedback later. And thank you again for joining us tonight for Are You Really Ready to Retire? Lounge and Learn and best wishes to all of you as you 